This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we spend the hour with Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist who's inspired millions across the globe. Last year, as a 15-year-old, she launched a school strike for the climate, started by going in front of the Swedish parliament every day for three weeks, then skip school every Friday to stand in front of the parliament demanding action to prevent catastrophic climate change. Her protests spread quickly going global. Hundreds of thousands of school kids around the globe have participated in their own local school strikes for the climate. Since her strike began in 2018, Greta has become a leading figure in the climate justice movement. She's joined protests across Europe. She's addressed world leaders at the U.N. climate talks in Poland and the European Union Parliament. She has even met the Pope. And now she's in New York to join a global climate strike on September 20th and address the U.N. Climate Action Summit at the U.N. on September 23rd. Greta has refused to fly for years because of emissions, so she arrived here after two-week transatlantic voyage aboard a zero-emissions racing yacht. She's also planning to attend the U.N. Climate Summit in Santiago, Chile, in December. I sat down with Greta Tuesday in our Democracy Now! studio. Greta Thunberg, it's great to have you back on Democracy Now! Thank you. So, Greta, why don't we start at the beginning? Um, there's a great controversy, and it's how you pronounce your name. Can you say your full name for us? Greta Thunberg. And that's the Swedish version. And yeah. as you come to the United States, people are calling you by different um, names. Can you yeah. tell us how you sort of adapt? Sometimes it's Thunberg, sometimes it's Thunberg. I, I mean, but I think it's funny that everyone pronounces it differently. Differently, so that is just I don't mind anyone pronouncing it wrong. There's no wrong way to pronounce it. Everyone pronounces it in their own way. So say again how you were born, what your parents called you. Greta Thunberg. Well, Greta, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Let's start at the beginning, how you got involved with climate action, how you got involved being deeply concerned about the climate crisis. How old were you? I think when I... I think I was maybe seven, eight, nine years old when I when I first heard about the the problem, and then of course by time I read about it more and more, and sort of understood how how important it was and how severe this crisis was, and um, so it was around that age and maybe ten, eleven, twelve. I think I became really into the climate movement when I was 12, 13, and that's when I became like a climate activist. I went to demonstrations in my spare time, and I tried to join organizations and movements and so on. And um, But then I just thought that everything was still happening too slow, and that it wasn't going fast enough. So then I just decided that I'm going to do something on my own. And uh, that might not work, but there's a chance it will, it can have an impact. And I thought, why not try? So then I started school striking for the climate. You went through a crisis in that period after you were eight years old. Can you talk about what you went through? Yeah, it was, after that, I sort of, caught up with reading about it and I understood and that made me very depressed of course and when when you are the only one who who really reacts about this crisis and everyone else seems to just okay it's very important but I I'm too busy with my life and I just thought that it was very strange that no one else was behaving in in a logical way and so i what would that logical way have been to do something to step out of your comfort zone and to realize that okay 
we cannot continue like we have done now. We need to do something drastically. And I and I'm going to do everything I can to to help to push in the right direction. And but no one seemed to do that. My parents were just like continuing like before. My classmates, everyone of my relatives. I mean, no one was. No one seemed to care about these issues except me, and that was a strange feeling. And so you descended into a depression. Yes, um, it was of course uh, caused by many reasons, but that was, I think, the biggest reason to it because I just thought that everything is just so wrong and everything is so strange and everything is so sad and why isn't anyone doing anything about this and so then i fell into a depression and um it lasted for maybe a year or something and then i you stopped or, talking yeah i stopped i stopped talking to because i have selective mutism or at least had, they said it sometimes grows away, um, that I only spoke to some people, my teacher, for instance, my parents, um, some members of my family, and so on. Um, and I stopped eating almost entirely. I only... It was a big problem. I lost a lot of weight because I was just so depressed. Nothing seemed to matter anymore. And... Um, but then I started to 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 come back, to to become better, to feel better, and uh, a reason for that was because I saw that there are actually things you can do, and I realized that I can do things. I shouldn't be sitting here doing nothing, wasting wasting my time when I can actually have an impact. And then I sort of started to to become better and um, then I became a climate activist and that helped a lot and I think the more involved I became the more involved I got in the climate movement the better I feel the happier I feel because I feel like I'm doing something important something meaningful so talk about what happened what you did about what just about a year ago now you were 15 years old um, you went in front of the Swedish parliament every single day at the beginning? Yeah. First, or, I mean, every school day, not Saturday and Sunday, but every school day for three weeks uh, until the, the upcoming election. And then that was my plan to stop after the election. But then on, on the Friday, uh, September 7th, I, that's when Fridays for Future um, started because then I thought, why not continue? Why stop now when we are actually having an impact? So then I and some other school strikers thought that we we should go on and we should call it Fridays for Future and we should be on Fridays. And how did the Swedish MPs respond to you? Uh, this 15-year-old girl, teenager, on the steps of the Swedish parliament all day? In the beginning, they didn't notice me. They, everyone just went straight past, and— um, Were you holding a sign? Yes, a big sign made out of wood. That said? Yeah. It said and on it? Skolstrek for klimatet. And then some flyers I handed out, which I said, where it said, uh, we children don't usually do what you adults tell us to do, we do as you do. And since you don't give a damn about my future, then I won't either. So I'm school striking for the climate and so on. And on the back, I had spent a lot of time writing down facts I thought everyone should know. And I handed out these flyers, and um, yeah. But in the beginning, no one noticed me. Everyone just went straight past. Even when people started to gather there, the politicians, the 
parliamentarians, they didn't see me, and um, and to and then to some point it became ridiculous in a way because I saw them every every day first and then every Friday, and then and they never said hi. So after a while they started to say like hi, good morning, and I said good morning, but they didn't really highlight it in in a way and then when it became famous when it became big then they started to of course take advantage of that and say like we support Greta and the school strikers and so on because they will always post next to you if that gains them and um do you remember what some of the facts were on the back of that poster you carried? Yes, it was that, of course, it needs to be updated today, but it was like up to 200 species are going extinct every single day. And then, of course, sources on that. And, um, and like, we are in the beginning of the sixth mass extinction. Um, and just facts that I thought people should know, that should be common knowledge. Um, and also a bit about Swedish emissions, about how a lot of our emissions weren't even included in where we... I mean, the official emissions and, uh, and just how much the average Swede emits CO2 per year and so on. So before you went global, um, we met you in Poland, um, uh, before we came seeing your hashtag, seeing your um, Twitter feed, it said, at the time you were 15, 15-year-old um, climate activist with Asperger's. That's the part we didn't talk about yet, the Asperger's. When were you diagnosed, and how do you think that contributes to your concern and your singular focus on this issue? When I am really interested in something, I, I get super focused on that. And uh, I can spend hours upon hours not getting tired of, of reading about it and still be, still be interested to learn more about it. And um, that is very common for people on the autism spectrum. And um, yeah, and and it just I think that was one of the reasons why why I was one of the few who really reacted to the climate crisis because I couldn't connect the dots why why people were just going on like before and still saying, yes, climate change is very important. I don't get that double moral in a way. Um, the difference from between what, between what you, what you know and what you say and what you, what you do, how you act. And for me, that's, it's called cognitive dissonance. And I don't really, I, in a way, I walk the walk. If I decide to do something, then I I do it. And um, so, yeah. You've called being on the spectrum your superpower. Why? Um, because it helps me see things in a way that others might not see. And it, it just helps me be different, which I think is a superpower where in a society where everyone is the same, where everyone thinks the same, everyone looks the same, everyone does the same things. And so I think that is something to to really be proud of, that you are different. And in in such a crisis like this, we need we need to think outside the box. We need outside the box thinking. We cannot continue thinking like we are today within our current system. And we need to, and then we need people who, 
who think outside the box and who can see this from a different perspective from and and of course it's not always only a gift and a superpower that many people suffer from suffer from it because they cannot get the right adjustments they need and they are not living under the right circumstances which i didn't as well for for a long time but now i do and so talk about how you've decided to live your life. Yes, you do this climate strike at least once a week, and we'll talk about what you're doing here as well in the United States. But the personal decisions you've made that are also political decisions, for example, what you eat, what you wear, how you travel. Yes, I, uh, I think it was two or three, maybe four years ago, I stopped flying. And because that seemed like a big thing to do, because the the impact, the climate impact of aviation on a global scale, I mean, individually, it is such a big, it has such a big carbon footprint. And so I just decided I'm not going to fly anymore. And that, of course, was a lot of trouble for my family because they wanted us to go on vacation and and so on. So I was kind of a troublemaker. Um, but then I actually convinced them, uh, I guilted them into also doing it. First my mom and then my dad as well and my sister as well. And um, And then also I am vegan um, and I have shop stop it means that you don't buy new things consume new things unless you absolutely have to so and just these small things I can do in my everyday life um, apart from activism and highlighting the problem so in terms of being a vegan explain what that means that I don't use any products made from, I mean, any, I don't eat, for example. Any animal product. Any animal products. I don't use any animal products, um, both because of ethical and environmental and climate reasons. And in terms of clothes, you don't buy new clothes? No. <laughs> Either I buy second hand um, or I receive clothes from someone else or I just keep my own clothes maybe use my sister's clothes or my mother's or father's clothes and yeah we so when we saw you in Poland at the UN climate summit and Katowice talk about how you got there if you don't fly talk about how you get around I go by by bus, by train, um, electrical car, and sailboat uh, now as well. And it takes a lot of time. And of course, I'm not saying that everyone should should stop flying and start sailing everywhere. But it was. I thought that I am one of the very few people in the world who can actually do this and who has this opportunity to do this trip. And uh, then I thought, why not? And it sure gained a lot of attention. So I want to go to the speech you gave uh, when we saw you in Poland, uh, in Katowice, at the UN Climate Summit. This is a clip of what you had to say uh, to the UN Secretary General and all those who were gathered for the UN Climate Summit, for the COP. Today we use 100 million barrels of oil every single day. There are no politics to change that. There are no rules to keep that oil in the ground. So we can no longer save the world by playing by the rules, because the rules have to be changed. So we have not come here to beg the world leaders to care for our future. They have ignored us in the past and they will ignore us again. 
We have come here to let them know that change is coming, whether they like it or not. The people will rise to the challenge. And since our leaders are behaving like children, we will have to take the responsibility they should have taken long ago. Thank you. That's Greta Thunberg speaking at the UN Climate Summit in Poland when she was 15 years old. As you watch this clip, Greta, you were smiling. Why? It, it's always fun to, to see it, <laughs> because it's, I don't know, just the way I talked and the way I, it is a pretty radical thing. It is pretty radical things to say in front of the Secretary General of the UN. And um, I remember that that speech because before I I had prepared a speech and my father read it through and he was like, you cannot say this. This is too radical. You will, this was, and you will embarrass yourself and you will embarrass everyone because you cannot say this. And then I just say, okay, and I, and I cut it out. What so, was it that so you were saying? This, we, we can no longer save the world by playing by the rules. And I mean, that's, or if it was the, why should I be studying for a future that soon may be no more and so on. It was something like that. And I cut it out so that he would see it and be calm because he was very stressed. And, um, and then of course I, I memorized that sen those sentences. And so I said them anyways during the speech. But you went on from Poland and you just continue to address uh, more and more global bodies or regional bodies, like in April. Um, when you address the European Parliament, where you urge lawmakers to respond as urgently to the climate crisis as they did um, when much of Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral burned. Yesterday, the world watched with despair and enormous sorrow how the Notre Dame burned in Paris. Some buildings are more than just buildings, but the Notre Dame will be rebuilt. I hope that its foundations are strong. I hope that our foundations are even stronger. But I fear they are not. So talk about that trip and how you ended up there at the European Parliament. Yes, I went there by, by train, of course. And uh, I remember because that speech I had to, to re rewrite the night before, because the night before, or the evening before, was when Notre Dame burned. And um, I thought, I have to include that in the speech. And um, so I had to, to sort of, so it was a stressful night before to, to get that sorted. But it was, and it was, I remember, I think it was that speech, I cried during the speech um, because it was so emotional with the things I was saying. Um, the, I was talking about the loss of biodiversity and forests and acidification of the oceans and so on, and I just suddenly became very sad. Let's go to this clip. Deforestation of our great forests toxic air pollution, loss of insects and wildlife, the acidification of our oceans. These are all disastrous trends being accelerated by a way of life that we, here in our financially fortunate part of the world, see as our right to simply carry on. And after that, I think I went to Rome. Um, yeah. You mean you went to see the Pope? Yeah, to Rome and to the Italian Senate and to see the Pope and, um, yeah, well, and then to London. Let's that, talk about visiting the Pope, what that meant to you and what the Pope has said about the climate crisis and what you said to him. Yes, I mean, he has been 
pretty outspoken about this. Um, so I think that is good that he's he's talking about this. And he was very supportive. And he said that that I should continue doing this. And um, so yeah, it was it was incredible to meet him, of course. And I was very honored to to have the chance to do that and to speak to him. And when you give these speeches, who do you consult? I mean, um, when we saw you in Poland, also on the show, we had Kevin Anderson, the well-known climate scientist. Frankly, he didn't want to come on with you because he said, uh, give Greta all the time, she's much more important than I am. But you two sat together. Um, do you speak with climate scientists? I do, very often. Um, I ask them for, like, advice and how should I phrase this and so on, so that there won't be any misunderstandings in what I'm saying. And also to, I mean, they help me a lot to, they read through my speeches to make sure that all the facts are correct. And, um, and I can just, if I wonder something, I can just email some of them or text, and then I, they often reply very, very quickly. So they are very helpful. Talk about the issue of climate justice and what that means to you, Greta. Well, I mean, you can explain it in different ways, but an incredibly important thing in that is that those who have caused the climate crisis the most are those who often are going to be the least affected, and the opposite, those who have caused it, contributed to it the least, are most likely the ones to be most affected. And therefore we must make sure that, that of course, that we can help these people and that it is not so unfair in everything. So, Greta Thunberg, I want to talk about the movements all over the world that you are very much a part of and are inspiring. When you went to Britain, you spoke in the British Parliament, but you also um, spoke at an Extinction Rebellion protest, and we want to play a clip. We are now facing an existential crisis, the climate crisis and ecological crisis, which have never been treated as crisis before. They have been ignored for decades. And for way too long, the politicians and the people in power have gotten away with not doing anything at all to fight the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. But we will make sure that they will not get away with it any longer. Greta, there you are addressing a group at the Extinction Rebellion. Um, that group was just really formulating when we were in Poland. Um, uh, they were there in Britain starting to superglue themselves to places like ExxonMobil headquarters and other places. Can you talk about the significance of this movement? Yes, I mean, the Extinction Rebellion had really had a massive impact, I think on our debate, especially in, in Europe, maybe not as much here, but that they are using civil disobedience because they are saying, like, we won't get your attention otherwise. And uh, that is very effective. And um, so it is really incredible to see what they are doing. And it's that along with Fridays for Future and other, many other movements, countless of other climates and environmental movements, I think we work together very well. And um, that I think that we together have succeeded in making this a priority. Uh, it feels like people are slowly starting to wake up a bit more. and. Um, it has become more important for, for people, uh, the climate and ecological crisis. So I think that that is very good. Of course, it's not enough. Of course, it's way too slow, but it's still, it's still something. 
Gerdia Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist who's inspired millions across the globe to demand action to prevent catastrophic climate change. Ahead of the U.N. Climate Action Summit, she'll address later this month, Greta arrived in New York after a two-week transatlantic voyage aboard a zero-emission sailboat. I asked her to describe the journey. I got here on a on a sailboat, emission-free race sailboat, and um, it was in, it was actually very a very good experience. I I wish more people had the opportunity to do it because it was incredible, and. Um, you might think that it was scary and hard and rough, but it was. I didn't feel like that at all. I wasn't. I was very lucky. I didn't feel seasick at all during these two weeks, and um, we went very fast. We hit 30 knots, I think, two times, and that is very fast for a sailing boat. And what was it like being out at sea? I mean, this was completely new for you. Describe yeah. the experience. Most people never take a journey like this. Um, before I went on the sailboat, I didn't really have— I chose to not have any expectations, because I just thought that I, I just do it and enjoy it on the way. So, but it was actually not that bad. Um, you never got seasick? No. And it was just amazing to be in this wilderness and to see the wildlife there with so many dolphins and um, other wildlife. And if, if it was calm, then during the nights you could see the stars very clearly and you can see the Milky Way, and um, and um, yeah, so it was, it was, it felt very good to be disconnected, to not have contact with people outside, um, unless through, I mean, satellite phone and so on. Your sails, the sails on this boat, these black sails. Um, said in white letters, unite behind the science. Why did you choose that? I choose, I mean, they gave me an opportunity, like, you can write something on the sail if we are, we are making new sails, and if you want, you can, you can write something on them. And then I thought, yeah. <laughs> and I, it was, I don't know. I choose it because that is what I want people to do. I want people to unite behind the science because I am not... All I am telling people to do now is to unite behind the science. And that is what we have to realize that that is what we have to do right now. Let me ask you about a New York Times op-ed piece, a column in the New York Times that was written by um, Christopher Caldwell. Um, it's headlined, The Problem with Greta Thunberg's Climate Activism, Her Radical Approach is at Odds with Democracy. Caldwell writes, Normally, Ms. Thunberg would be unqualified to debate in a democratic forum. He ends his piece by saying, Democracy often calls for waiting and seeing. Patience may be democracy's cardinal virtue. Climate change is a serious issue, but to say we can't wait is to invite a problem just as grave, he says. Greta Thunberg, if you can respond to Christopher Caldwell. There's nothing I can say to them, just unite behind the science. I'm not the one who's saying these things. I'm not the one who we should be listening to, and I say that all the time. I say we need to listen to the scientists. And he ends by saying, we have to wait. Yeah, we have waited 30 years, and I think we have been patient and been waiting and seeing in 30 years, and I think it's time to, to actually realize the urgency of the problem and to, to do something.
It may shock people to hear that you are getting slammed on Twitter, also praised to the heavens by millions of people. But what do you think that means when you get slammed? I mean, you can see it in different ways. Of, of course, it's sad that people spend their time doing this when they could be doing something good instead. But it's you can also see it as something positive, that it means that you have an impact, that these people feel like they feel threatened by you, and that means you have made a difference. And I think this movement has made a difference. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending their time trying to discredit us and to mock us. I'd like to talk more about the attack on climate activists. I want to turn to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, the former president of Chile, talking about the attacks on climate activists, including you. The Office and Special Rapporteurs have noted attacks on environmental human rights defenders in virtually every region, particularly in Latin America. I'm, I am disheartened by this violence and also by the verbal attacks on young activists such as Greta Thunberg and others who galvanize support for prevention of the harm their generation may bear. The demands made by environmental defenders and activists are compelling, and we should respect, protect and fulfill their rights. So that's Michelle Bachelet, now the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. She was the president of Chile, which will be hosting the UN Climate Summit, the COP25 in December, where Greta will be. Um, it was going to be Brazil, um, but uh, they withdrew their invitation to host the COP because of the far right climate change denying President Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, Greta, if you can talk about uh, what Michelle Bachelet said, she singled you out, um, talking about climate activists and attacks on them. But so many climate activists feel under siege. And also talk about your plans leading up to COP25, the UN summit, as you make your way through the Americas. Yes. Uh, many climate and environmental activists are being attacked, and they are being, in some cases, even killed. And um, so I'm not the one who who we should be focusing on in these cases but and um, and it's it's just horrible that you are trying to stand up for something we sh that should be taken for granted um, a living world and a functioning climate and um, it's just unbelievable to see what some people have to go through and uh, of course i know many many activists, um, young activists um, especially, that are being attacked on the internet and are being lied about and being mocked, uh, sometimes by elected officials and by respected journalists. And I don't understand how, how you can attack someone like that. And I mean, Sometimes these these activists get they get sad because of it, and that of course impacts them in a way that they feel like they they cannot continue, and that is of course what they they want. That is the goal of these attacks. So I just and the other activists who support we support each other. We just have to comfort each other and to, to be there for each other and to say, like, don't care about these people because they, all they are doing is to, their goal is to waste your time and to make you tired of this and to make you want to stop because what you are doing is actually good. You just recently tweeted um, that Amazon workers, 900 of them, based in Seattle, it's the first time ever, they're going to also strike on September 20th. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Um, to me and to the movement, it means incredibly much, because we have lots of unions who are planning to, to strike. Um, so, I mean, adults striking from their work, and that is so incredibly important to show that this is such and this is not just for children or teenagers but this is for everyone and um, what we are doing we are not of course 
I mean, we are striking to to disrupt the system, to to create a tension, and um, I just hope that it will turn out well. So let's talk about what you're doing in these coming days. Uh, you're heading down to Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. Um, on Friday, what are your plans? That's Friday, September 13th. Yes, uh, on Friday, I am going to this Friday, the 13th. Uh, I am going to to join the school strike for the climate outside the White House in Washington, D.C. And uh, I do you protest every single week on Fridays? Yes. Wherever you are in the yes, world? Yes, even on the boat. Every week, no matter where I am, on Fridays, I will protest and demonstrate for the climate. Um, on the outside the parliament or local government building or town hall or, or anything. So on the 13th, you're doing it in front of the White House. Yes. Um, when you landed last week, um, you landed on Wednesday evening. Friday, you were in front of the United Nations. Yeah. With those who you inspired who had been protesting in front of the United Nations uh, for many weeks, almost a year. So then talk about the following week, um, September 20th, what your plans are and what people's plans are around the globe. Yes, uh, on the 20th, we, we are planning a new global strike, and um, we call for people of all ages to join us, not just children. Adults are, of course, welcome as well to strike from their work. And um, so I will be in, in New York uh, the 20th of September to join the, the strike here. And, uh, and then on the 27th, there is also a global strike. And then you head, eventually, in December, to the U.N. Climate Summit in Chile. Talk about the journey you plan to take between September and December. Yes. In December, um, uh, I'm planning to go to the COP25, and, um, which is in Santiago. So it's, it's, it's quite a long way there from here. So I will have to make sure to leave on time and th travel through the North and South American continent and probably sail for a bit where it's too hard to, to travel. Um, so, and then I will be there. And uh, I don't know exactly what I will be doing there, but I have been invited to speak there. And, and then after that, um, we'll see. What I, what I'm doing, and finally, your message to young people—people um, perhaps who don't vote—that's true—but um, uh, are finding their place in the world. What do you say to them? And you can look directly into the camera. Um, my message to to the young people of the world is that right now we are facing an existential crisis. Um, I mean, the climate and ecological crisis, and it will have a massive impact on our lives in the future, but also now, especially in vulnerable communities. And um, I think that we should, we should wake up and we should also try to wake the adults up, because they are the ones who their generation is the ones who, who are mostly responsible for this crisis, and we need to hold them accountable. We need to hold the people in power accountable for what they have been doing to us and future generations and other living species on Earth. And we need to, need to get angry and understand what is at stake, and then we need to transform that anger into action and to stand together, united, and, um, and just never give up.
That's 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg in her first extended broadcast interview here in the United States. She'll be protesting in front of the White House on Friday, then taking part in the global climate strike on Friday, September 20th, here in New York. On Monday, September 23rd, she'll address the U.N. General Assembly at the U.N. Climate Action Summit. And she'll be at the U.N. Climate Summit in Santiago, Chile, in December. Democracy Now! will be there as well, covering all of these events. That does it for our broadcast, Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermit Shea, Carla Wills, Tommy Warnoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton. Special thanks to Robbie Karen. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.